Hello and good morning friends welcome to this easy edusit live lecture dear friends as you know that we have uh, completed almost 15 lectures under the series the history of english literature this is the 16th lecture in the series and today we would be talking on the romantic criticism in the first session we would be discussing on uh, romantic critical theory and in the second half we would be specifically going to talk on romantic practical criticism and for this we have once again within our studios professor bheem singh dahiya professor Bhim Singh Dhaiya is an eminent academician, uh, the academician who has a fan following, who has students in India and abroad. He visits various universities and colleges uh, as a guest faculty. And I would like to tell you all that he has been formerly vice chancellor of the Kurukshetra University. Dear friends, let's take advantages from his experiences and let's try to get more and more knowledge on the topic. the romantic criticism so i would like to welcome our guest professor bheem singh thaiya hello sir welcome to the edisit lecture thank you well in this lecture we shall discuss the romantic critical theory generally the impression is that the romantics were deficient in theory because the neo classical say writers critics Uh, dramatists poets uh, they always uh, say uh, went by theory they will not proceed without a theory that is why everything was well defined like what is an epic what is tragedy what is comedy what is poetry what is prose so on and so forth so there were rules laid down commonly accepted and um, in neo classical theory there could be nothing beyond the framework but uh, when romantic movement came around the end of the 18th century and beginning of the 19th so there was a revolt against the neo classical uh, norms both of life and literature so the politics of the neo classical age the social structure of the age and then the literary view of uh, the age all these they came under attack from the new generations and they revolted against the life of rules and the literature guided and controlled by rules so uh, the things were reversed as i keep saying action and reaction are equal and opposite both in life as well as literature so there was a reaction against the neo classical uh, philosophy and aesthetics uh, politics similarly uh, there was uh, a reaction against uh, whatever was being practiced in literature by the neo classicals hence during the romantic age things were reversed from the 18th century if the neo classical writers uh, gave all importance to uh, frame to shape to the outward form the romantics gave uh, all importance to the content what is inside that frame what is inside the the, the shape the form the outward structure so they were more concerned about what is inside just as human personality outside you create a network of social ethos political ethos uh, then morals manners all this is outward paraphernalia of life but the romantic said all this is false artificial what is more solid and what is more reliable is what is inside hence uh, they relied upon 
the heart, emotion, rather than reason. In the 18th century, reason was the guiding principle. So, nothing could be acceptable or permissible unless it is acceptable to reason, to rationality and to reasoned uh, uh, ways of life and literature. But now, no, there is no such uh, general norm or framework uh, accepted, accepted by all. Hence, the emphasis now is on individualism. Each and every individual uh, has his, her own driving force and her, his own experience. And therefore, uh, every individual will consult her, his own heart and mind. And therefore, the authenticity of the expression, the authenticity of uh, what is being said in a poem will come from within, internal. It can't be imposed from outside. So, it will spontaneously come out from within. So, uh, the, these are two opposite philosophies of life and literature the neoclassical and now the romantic. So, the romantic philosophy is a revolt against uh, the neoclassical and hence we have a different set of writers who rely upon the individual talent, not on general principles. In the uh, first place, we have Wordsworth who was senior of them all. So, Wordsworth gave the theory of language. If you read his preface to the lyrical ballads, which were combinedly uh, written by Wordsworth and Coleridge. But Wordsworth wrote preface to the lyrical ballads. And in that preface, he emphasized nature and naturalness, including the nature and naturalness of man, of humanity. So, whatever comes later as way of civilization, culture, our way of life, he thought that was artificial. And hence, the natural man, his natural emotions, natural instincts, they should be relied upon and they are common to all. Uh, it, it was this thinking of Wordsworth, which then revolted against the, the artificial language of the neoclassical times. Because the language in neoclassical poetry is totally different from what is commonly spoken by people. Wordsworth said no we have to go back to nature and we have to go back to the language of the people, the language that people speak. And that is the authentic language because that language uh, comes from uh, your experience, real life. And it is not uh, just prepared in the libraries or from the books. So, it is this going back to nature, to the original human nature, to the real man uh, in life. That is the emphasis in the romantic uh, philosophy, romantic theory of literature, largely poetry. Uh, so, Wordsworth gave the first clarion call a revolt against the 18th century, discarding the artificial language. It was so artificial that uh, the words used in com everyday speech 
they were not considered literary they were not considered poetic hence they were not to be used for example fish is a common word which all of us use in our conversation in our talk but in poetry they will say scaly tribe very artificial it has nothing to do with everyday speech so uh, wordsworth said why use this this is sophisticated maybe this is technical known to a few very learned people why don't we use a language which is known to everybody and which is used by everybody so that argument worked in his preface uh, to the lyrical ballads and he emphasized the language of the common people not uncommon not scholars not poets but language of the ordinary people even illiterate people because that is the language which is authentic and that has uh, the life force in it hence uh, a total reversal of the neoclassical uh, aesthetics so now you have natural language authentic language language spoken by the common people and no longer the artificial and uh, uh, language of the poets only technicians uh, who are not common people they are uncommon and they are separated by their very specialism so uh, you have this change which was a big change and therefore you find in wordsworth in coleridge a language used which is you know, the same as those of that of common people hence the change that was one thing change in the language of poetry language of literature so theory of language was given by wordsworth similarly a general theory about uh, uh, what is imagination what is fancy what is reason was given by s t coleridge s t coleridge was uh, uh, the most philosophic among the romantic poets and writers he was the one who was formally trained in philosophy and he was a thinker and he wrote philosophic books it aids to reflection for example was a philosophic book and there and elsewhere also like a general biographical book biographia literaria which is compendium of several kinds of things he combines there whatever he knew of whatever he had experienced uh, all that is put together in biographia literaria so there he defines what is imagination what is fancy what is reason what is understanding he says all these are qualities of human mind but then uh, they are not at par you can't level them down there is a difference of degrees difference of the stage so you have the lower faculties and you have the higher faculties so reason and understanding uh, coleridge thinks are lower faculties of the mind whereas fancy and imagination they are the higher faculties of the human mind and imagination is the highest even fancy comes lower uh, in category to imagination because fancy as he defines can combine things can separate things but 
it can do only that much. It can put things together, it can separate things one from the other, but nothing beyond. Whereas imagination after doing this can recreate, it can recreate something new. So from the combination of several things, several experiences of life, several thoughts that you have gathered, uh, you recreate something new, something higher. And that, he says, can be done only by imagination and by no other faculty of the mind. Hence, imagination comes at the top. Uh, if we go back to 18th century or the neoclassical uh, age, we find imagination is seldom used. The word imagination, and if at all it is used, it is used casually, that you imagine things as if you are doing something silly, something idle, something not of serious consequence. It was this attitude to imagination which 18th century or neoclassical writers had. But for the romantics, imagination is the highest faculty and they think it is a godlike faculty. Just as God created humanity and this universe, so man through his imagination can create and recreate new things. That's why all your literature, it may be a poem or a play or a novel or an essay, all these creations are uh, from your imagination. So imagination is the only faculty which has this capacity to create new things. And that is why it is held in highest esteem by the Romantics. It was not done by the neoclassicals. They held reason as supreme and therefore whatever not uh, uh, appeals to reason, they will not accept it. Here reason is considered a lower faculty. Imagination is higher. So Coleridge uh, defined these terms, being a philosopher himself, so he defined what is reason, what is understanding, what is fancy, what is imagination. Another theorist among the romantics was uh, P. B. Shelley, Percy by C. Shelley. Now, um, Shelley also wrote uh, in defense of poetry. Why does he call it defense? Because uh, there was a senior contemporary of Shelley, uh, Peacock. So he had written around the same time a book called The Four Ages of Poetry. The Four Ages of Man, sorry. And in that book he said that poetry belongs to the primitive stage of man, primitive period, when man didn't have much of civilization, man did not have much of culture, not much of education, and uh, he was living as an uncivilized uh, animal, like um, other species, uh, not much difference. So at that stage, he says, poetry was the medium, uh, not prose, because uh, man had uh, no reason developed at that stage. So went by his emotions, went by whatever he felt. So not much difference between the other animal species 
and the humans. That is what uh, Peacock said. But then Shelley questioned it. He said, no. Poetry is not the language or outcome of the primitive man. Poetry, uh, Shelley says, is the highest expression of man. And he says, poets are his famous uh, last uh, sentence of his essay. Uh, he says, poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. Means they legislate about human life. They are the most profound thinkers among men. Hence, poets are to be valued, unacknowledged legislators of the world. That is the last sentence of his defense of poetry. Uh, Alfred uh, J. Peacock, in reply to uh, his accusations, so to say, or charges against uh, poets, uh, that poetry is for the primitive people, not for the civilized or cultured one. But uh, Shelley said the opposite. He said this is the finest expression of human civilization. Hence, uh, we have to value what the poets have to say, uh, not what uh, other thinkers like scientists or social scientists, but poets. So they have to be taken more seriously. So now you can see in what direction now uh, the, the uh, course of English literature is moving. It's moving towards more seriousness, moving towards content, moving towards the inside and moving from the surface life, from social and political life into the interior, into the internal, into the intuitive. Uh, it is this difference which the Romantics brought about. So Shelley emphatically uh, defended uh, poetry in defense of poetry. And that document gave another theory of poetry, philosophy about what poetry is and what poets are. Now, yet another uh, theorist among the Romantics, besides Wordsworth, Coleridge, Shelley, uh, we had um, uh, like uh, Hazlitt, we had uh, Charles Lamb and uh, uh, De Quincey, several others. But here, uh, so far as theory is concerned, the romantic theory of criticism, uh, the more important among these leftovers is uh, Charles Lamb and of course Hazlitt. Hazlitt wrote uh, his famous book called The Spirit of the Age. Now, which is an important theoretical document in a way. Theoretical because he formulates uh, a philosophy about uh, the spirit of the age. Uh, before that, uh, nobody had talked about uh, anything of the kind like the spirit because everything was physical, everything was material, everything was external, everything was socio-political and well-defined and accepted in terms of morals and manners. But then these romantics, they said, no, whatever is public, whatever goes in the name of morals and manners, uh, it is superficial. The greater truth 
and more intensely felt truth about life is inside. And therefore, that must be given priority. So Hazlitt emphasized this, uh, this new aspect of life and literature, the spirit of the age. So that spirit of the age gets reflected both in your uh, life structures as well as uh, literary structures. So it may be your socio-political institutions or it may be literary forms and uh, shapes. Both uh, are informed by the spirit of the age. In other words, in every age, there is one, two or a set of forces which dominate, which are the driving force. Like now in the 21st century, technology is the driving force that, that dominates. In the Romantic age, it was uh, the, the drive for the real, the original, the natural, the interior, the inside of things. So that was the spirit of the age. So Hazlitt wrote that important essay, The Spirit of the Age. So after that, we started paying attention to whatever are the general and powerful driving forces of the age. So one has to study that. One has to study the historical phenomenon, uh, which is driving your civilization, where your culture in a particular direction. So there has to be this spirit. And that spirit drives you to a particular end, destination. You have a goal. So uh, this was emphasized for the first time. It was not done during the age of Pope or Johnson or Dryden. It was not there. But now this awareness about there being a common driving force, uh, civilizations and cultures uh, do not uh, say go forth at random. After all, they move in a particular direction. They have certain goals set uh, for themselves and they want to achieve those goals. And therefore, they are being driven and dominated by certain forces. The spirit of the age, the driving force, hence this idea came. And thereafter, uh, the literary criticism uh, uh, started taking into account the dominant forces, the spirit which informs as much uh, literature as it does life. Uh, thank you. Well, in this lecture, we'll be talking about the practical criticism in the Romantic age. Uh, for the first time, we have uh, 
criticism in practice, which means individual poets or dramatists and individual poems or plays, uh, they are closely uh, being looked into and a concentrated attention is being paid to the individual pieces and they are being analyzed, they are being understood in detail. That is what practical criticism is. So, you apply whatever your theoretical framework uh, you have evolved for yourself to the individual literary pieces. It may be drama, poetry, novel, essay, whatever. So, you have a framework, you have a theory, you have a philosophy, but you apply it to the individual piece and then uh, look into it, its merits. The difference between again the neoclassical and the romantic is that the neoclassical writers were slave to the rule. So, whatever is not covered by the rules, they will not take it into account, they will not consider it, they will not give it any weightage. Therefore, whatever the authorities had done, the ancient authorities like Aristotle or Horace or the actual writers Sophocles or Virgil. Now, uh, the neoclassical poets and critics went by whatever these authorities had said and very slavishly without questioning, without even reasoning about it, they accepted those ancient rules and applied them and followed them and practiced them. But during the romantic period, the romantic poets, critics, you see they relied upon their own individual reading, individual experience, individual ideas. Hence, no common philosophy, no common theory and therefore, no common practice. So, there is a greater value attached to the individual, that each individual has a talent of her, his own and that talent and that experience and those ideas have to be valued in their own right, not in terms of uh, somebody's philosophy. Everybody has his her own value, which means we are moving now in the beginning of the 19th century with the advent of Romanticism in the direction of democracy. We are moving in the direction of equal rights to all. We are uh, lending dignity to the common people and to each individual. So, there is no such distinction as the specialist and the common. In fact, the common carries more value here with the romantics. That is why there is that slogan of going back to nature, because they thought the what is uh, uh, called civilization or culture whatever goes in the name of these two is highly artificial. The natural man is the real authentic man and the natural instincts, natural uh, responses to life situations, uh, they are to be relied upon. And whatever philosophy of literature or life we evolve must address the natural man. If it is not based upon 
the experiences of the natural man, then it is all artificial. It is all cooked up. It is made up. It does not originate from the authentic life that nature has given us. So, uh, with these ideas, the romantics initiated practical criticism which was not there earlier. You see, whatever Dryden and Pope or Johnson uh, talk about in their poems, which are satires. So, satirical poetry, or no formal criticism as such, no practical criticism. So, whatever criticism uh, comes about uh, in that age, uh, comes about in their poems themselves, in the poetry. And what are they doing there? They are merely uh, pulling the legs of their rivals, attacking their own rivals, in the field of literature or politics, the highly personal. The romantics would hate to be personal in writing uh, about any aspect of literature or life. They would uh, like to be uh, sincere, authentic, observe integrity, honesty, and express themselves as naturally as possible. So, it is in a way anti-sophistication, anti-education, anti-culture, anti-civilization, because all these are distrusted as um, artificially created uh, agencies or frameworks. What is natural is the, the one that God or nature gave us, what we are born with. And therefore, uh, we have practical criticism now beginning. For example, De Quincey wrote a wonderful piece which is on the knocking scene in Macbeth. In Shakespeare's play Macbeth, Macbeth, after killing Duncan, who was a guest at his place, he kills him, murders him. And then, just as he has done it, he hears knocking at the door. Now, this small incident uh, De Quincey uh, says is very important. He brings out the significance of knocking. So, this small thing he picks up and gives us practical criticism, a very detailed account of its significance in the play. He says this knocking is not merely physical. It is not just a servant knocking at the door. It is symbolic of the knocking that now has started in the mind of Macbeth. Because whatever he has done uh, would not allow him now to sit at peace with himself. So, there is a knocking inside. In a way, psychological criticism. We generally say that psychological criticism begins after 1905 or 7, after uh, Freud, Sigmund Freud, he is a psychologist. But here is a piece much before, uh, almost a century before, uh, when De Quincey is giving us psychological interpretation of the knocking scene in Macbeth. So, the romantic critics started practical criticism, a close reading of the literary piece. Even smallest of incident, a scene in a play showing its significance. 
Now, this kind of close reading, this kind of significance of the parts was not done in the 18th century, in the neoclassical age. Or they will not attend to these minor things in a poem or a play. They would just go by the overall framework, whether the rules of uh, construction have been followed or not followed. So they were more concerned about the engineering, not about the content, not about the meaning, not about the message. But these romantics are more concerned about the meaning and message and therefore close reading, giving importance even the minor most incident in the play, knocking at the door in Macbeth. So this was written by uh, De Quincey. Similarly, Hazlitt wrote a piece called Characters of Shakespeare's Plays. Characters of Shakespeare's Plays. Earlier in the 18th century, <coughs> sorry, during the neoclassical age, Nobody will pay attention to individual characters. If you are talking about a play or talking about a poem, it may be epic, it may be tragedy or comedy. You are talking about largely the structure. You are talking about uh, the form and formal you see, aspects. Even morals and manners are formal aspects. What you practice publicly, not what you do in uh, your private hours, life, because that is hidden from uh, everybody else except yourself. But then the romantics made the private public. They brought out in uh, their poetry as well as criticism. Uh, uh, the, the, the interior, the internal, with all its intensity, integrity, honesty, and that is what they are doing. So Hazlitt wrote about the characters of Shakespeare's plays. Before that, nobody had attempted that. Nobody would pay attention to each and every character because that's not important for them. If it's an epic, they would rather go after who is the hero of the epic, what is the war of Troy, what for. So outline history and only the central thing uh, will be talked about. But here uh, not the central thing alone, not the structure alone, but every part of the structure. Every, uh, you say, uh, portion in the uh, picture, th that's of equal importance. So this kind of close attention to a play or a poem, talking about minor characters, major characters, characters at all, talking about incidents uh, in a play, this is being done for the first time. So Hazlitt wrote about the characters of Shakespeare's plays and uh, uh, he brought out uh, very uh, surprising things about character, which we generally ignore. We don't uh, bother about minor characters, for example, but he shows how minor characters are contributing to the overall pattern of the play overall impact of the play, effect of the play. So uh, Hazlitt did that, characters of Shakespeare's play. Similarly, Charles Lamb wrote dramatic literature of the age of Elizabeth. Dramatic literature of the age of Elizabeth. So you can say by and large, <clears throat> Sorry, all these 
uh, romantic essays, uh, criticism in practice, practical criticism. This is focused on drama and uh, even in drama on Shakespeare. So, for the first time we find that uh, in the age of Wordsworth or the Romantics, uh, we have criticism uh, which is focused on uh, these minor aspects of the play and particularly drama because Romantics are uh, known to be highly undramatic because romantic literature uh, is known to be lyrical, musical, non-dramatic. But then if you look into the practical criticism that these romantic poets are writing or romantic writers like Hazlitt, uh, all this addresses drama and drama of the age of Elizabeth. So, uh, this attention to drama by poets who are uh, known to be undramatic themselves, uh, this belies the general impression that the romantics were undramatic. They were equally concerned with drama uh, just as they were concerned with poetry or prose and um, that is why you see Lamb wrote on the dramatic literature of the age of uh, Elizabeth. Here another thing uh, uh, we must note down and that is the emphasis on Shakespeare. It was not there in the 18th century. It was not there in the neoclassical age. It is for the first time with the romantics that Shakespeare uh, comes to be held above every other writer. Shakespeare is given the supreme position in the galaxy of not only dramatists, but all poets. So, poets and dramatists here uh, uh, being um, considered as inferior to Shakespeare. So, what we call bardolatry means idolatry of the bard, that we start worshipping Shakespeare as a sort of deity, as a sort of god. So, this also starts with the romantics. It was not there earlier. Uh, whatever Johnson or Dryden uh, speak about Shakespeare, they only speak about his faults, that he was an imperfect dramatist. He was not master of uh, the rules of drama. And therefore, for the sake of popular uh, um, writing, he sacrificed uh, the rules, sacrificed the excellence and therefore, he is not as sophisticated as Dryden is or Pope is because they are masters of rules which he is not or even if he knows, he is careless about them. So, genius all right, but a careless genius not an articulate genius. That was the picture of Shakespeare during the 18th century. But now with the Romantics, you see uh, how much importance is being given to him. The age of drama, themselves highly undramatic, non-dramatic and then special attention to Shakespeare holding him about every other poet and dramatist, a special creation of God and having special gifts as a dramatist, 
as a poet. So this again began with the romantic critics. Uh, so Lamb brings out dramatic literature of the age of Elizabeth. Then the, the tradition of lectures also began with the romantics, which means making literature and literary criticism something popular. Before that, it was in the closet. It was with the specialist. It was in the study room of the poet and the critic. Dryden Pope Johnson, they will not go out and address the common people about it. They will hate to do it. They will think it will go beyond the heads of uh, the rebels, these common people. They are illiterate, boorish, so on and so forth, unsophisticated, uncultured, uncivilized. Uh, these were the general impressions of uh, the artificial age of 18th century, neoclassical. But now the romantics uh, gave importance to all this and they went out of their closets. They went out of their libraries. They went out of their studies and they went out to the common people. And therefore, uh, Coleridge uh, will start lecturing on Shakespeare. Of course, uh, there was also a strong reason uh, for doing that because uh, Coleridge uh, was short of money. Uh, he didn't have much money with him. And therefore, his friend suggested, Coleridge, you are such a great mind and such a, a great speaker. So why don't you give lectures? People will come to listen to you. And we can fix uh, some kind of ticket for it, some kind of payment, and therefore uh, there will be collection. Coleridge said, all right, I don't mind it so long as it can help me survive. It will fetch me some earning. So he started lecturing on Shakespeare and gradually it gathered momentum. So much so that even poets like John Keats, they used to go miles walking only to hear S.T. Coleridge speaking on Shakespeare. Hazlitt would do the same. So all these great minds of the age, they valued the uh, lecturing uh, speciality of S.T. Coleridge, his talent for it. Uh, he was a great talker. Uh, Lamb, of course, <laughs> uh, in one of his humorous essays, he says, uh, Englishmen, beware, the talkers are at large, uh, means Coleridge is out in the public lecturing. So he used to make fun. Friends, they were, they wouldn't mind making fun of each other. So uh, Coleridge had that reputation of being a great talker, a great lecturer. So he lectured on uh, Shakespeare and even Milton. So those lectures now published uh, are an important document, famous, and people read and research and reread them. Similarly, uh, Hazlitt also delivered lectures, lectures on the English poets, beginning with Chaucer. He lectured on each and every poet. So this again started with the romantics. This tradition of lecturing, this tradition of carrying your special knowledge to the general public. Uh, this started for the first time. So in a way, uh, this has also uh, the democratic side to it. 
This also had the socialist side to it, which means the romantics cared for the common people. They cared for the general public and they valued what, whatever was natural and common. And they discarded, discarded and distest, detested whatever was artificial, whatever was uh, made up in the name of civilization or culture. So going back to nature, going back to authenticity and setting up these traditions of a close reading, uh, paying attention to the minute aspects of a poem or a play. So this practical criticism started with the romantics. It was not there earlier. Earlier it was just theoretical. It was just uh, uh, general. But now it became particular. It became uh, individual and it cared for intensity, emotion, integrity, and all that, authenticity. So their practical criticism as well as their theoretical writings both support each other. They are complementary. Whatever is being formulated in theory is being applied in a practical criticism. So the two are two different branches of the same movement. So the romantic movement in uh, literature in general and literary criticism, criticism in particular has the same thrust. Thrust is towards the natural. Thrust is towards close attention to the individual and to give importance to the common people. Hence, democratization of literature, carrying it to the masses, making it available to them. So this is what the romantic critics are doing in their practical criticism. So both theory as well as uh, practical criticism, uh, they are two, diff two branches of the same movement. And it is only after putting them together that you get a complete picture of what the romantics were doing uh, theoretically and then practically. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so very much. Dear friends, we believe that you might have got deep insight into the topic, the romantic criticism. Uh, dear friends, if you have any queries or any suggestions, if you want to give your feedback also, then you can mail us at info.cc at the rate in Very soon, this lecture is going to be uploaded on YouTube for you. Keep watching us and keep giving your feedback. We would be meeting again tomorrow and would be discussing a new topic under the series, History of English Literature. Till then, take care. Goodbye. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much.